Well, hey, welcome back, everyone, to Behind the Series here with Time of Grace. It's me, Pastor Mike, and I joined, as almost always, sometimes we have our friend CL on this podcast, but we're happy to have back our friend Amber L.B. Swenson. Amber, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Woo! I'm getting my, I'm getting my backside kicked here in 2024. I feel like I'm uh, holding on for dear life. So I had to put out like the, the Mayday signal to some friends and our, our small group last night. So whew, I, I think I'm getting there. But if you hear me take a couple deep breaths, it's me trying to <laughs> trying to cope with life. So well, you just released a book too. I mean, you've had kind of a lot happening. Yeah. It's... Yeah. It's, it's, it's been awesome. Uh, a lot of really, really good things happening. Um, so just uh, taking it a day at a time. I'm a, uh, this is probably the dark side of my personality. I'm such a structured, I'm going to, I'm going to plan the boxes and I'm going to make the boxes. I'm going to check the boxes ahead of time. And then I feel good in my world. And uh, that world has, has been shaken. So, oh man, I don't know how the apostles did it. Like, all right, we're in prison. All right, let's do it now. So I, I need to. And a, they a... probably didn't have extra paper for boxes either. What? Yeah. How did, how did they rejoice in the Lord without a calendar to check? <laughs> I think they were maybe a little bit more easygoing. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> maybe Luke was like the calendar keeper, right? Like, guys, come on. We've got a chapter to get done. And... Yes, I like it. He does write a very organized gospel, so I can see it. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Awesome. And how about so, you? What do you think about me? How's your your started out? Yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm doing okay. I mean, nothing big one way or the other. I guess big news for me in Time of Grace is we're just opening up registration for our women's event. Yeah. So that's a big, Ooh. big deal today. But you know, that work, that was like a lot of work. And now we sort of sit and wait, like, how is it mm. going to go over? People are going to register. So now it's kind of just wait and see. Yeah. So Amber, uh, tell us a little bit more about this women's event. Yeah. So it's called Unbreakable, Finding Strength in the Storms. And we just really have this desire to connect Christian women together, to have a place where they can become a community really look to God. Um, we have great female speakers coming in and one brave male speaker coming in. <laughs> Pastor Jeremy Maddock is coming to do an evening devotions, evening encouragement devotion with us. But the idea is just to really develop a community of women uh, around some of the Time of Grace female bloggers and myself and some of the people I've had as guests on little things. So we're super, super excited about it. It's happening in April and there will be a link in the episode notes that you can click on to register. Yeah. I love it. My, uh, my good friend, one of my best friends, Missy Martins is going to be there as oh. a presenter. So she was telling me a little bit about it at a, yeah. a friend's party the other day. So uh, she's excited and I'm excited for you. Thank you. I'm super excited too. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So we're in the behind the series. Uh, we have a cool series we're kicking off called Jesus hashtag no filter. Uh, it's mm -hmm. on the gospel of John and some of the crazy things that Jesus said. So what do you think? Should we dive in? Please tell us the big idea. Yeah. So I was studying the gospel of John and it's it was so interesting to me that John is famous for talking about love. Um, God so loved the world, you know, here, as I have loved you, the father has loved me. So love one another, like kind of famous John. But when mm -hmm. you actually read the messages of Jesus and John, they are incredibly like offensive like if you were an empathetic person and you would have been in the crowd you would have been like oh no 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 stop saying that but jesus like he he pushed the truth side of things so hard he was so exclusive with his claims for truth and at the same time he was just incredibly inviting forgiving loving comforting so th that's what i found when we take the filter off of jesus and don't kind of chop him down to size. He becomes the the boldest, bravest, possibly most offensive and the most amazing, incredible, glorious, uh, forgiving, saving Lord that we could ever imagine. So that's what that's we're diving awesome. into in this series. Yeah, you can tell he didn't have a PR person telling him to keep it like PC, right? Like, <laughs> Jesus, <sponsors>. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They just pulled out. Come on. <laughs> okay. So the first series is without Jesus, there's only darkness. And you use the acronym LIGHT. And you said L is for life, I is for I see, G is for growth, H is for harsh, 
T is for safe T. <laughs> a little bit of a stretch there, but that's okay. We're good. <laughs> I admitted that. I did admit it was a stretch. You did. Yeah. You did. That was that was kind of like the dad joke <laughs> part of the acronym, but it's all good. But you know, that H really kind of threw me because I thought, you know, most people when thinking about Jesus as the light of the world, mm. they would not think of harsh. Mm. So why did you use harsh and what is what are you getting at with that? Yeah. Uh, Jesus himself said that in in John 3. So right after John 3, 16, the famous, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He says, you know, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness because their deeds were evil. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, when you're in the darkness, let's say you're 13, um, you're sleeping in on a Saturday and mom or dad says, okay, enough. And they just barge in, and they flip, flip on the lights, they whip open the blinds. Yeah. It's, it's so harsh um, for a scientific reason. Your eyes, your pupils have literally dilated to adjust to a low light environment. And so if you get lots of light flooding in, it, it actually hurts your, your body. It's harsh on your brain. And I, I thought that's kind of how Jesus is. If you're, if you've adjusted to the low light of our culture, and you open a Bible and read what Jesus said, it it feels so harsh. Yeah. Um, it won't feel that way always. Like once you adjust to the bright light, the, the sunshine of the word of God, yes. it, it won't feel that way. But in the beginning, when you hear about, nope, you're a sinner. What? I've, I've been told my whole life that I'm special and I'm wonderful and I'm deserving of love. No, you deserve hell. <laughs> what? Yeah, and in a marriage, uh, it's not a 50-50 compromise. It's husbands love your wives as Christ loved, and he sacrificed so much for the church. And wives, submit your husbands in every... What? <laughs> if it, The way we should forgive people, the way we should serve people, the, what, what we should do with our money, all of it, if it's brand new to you, I, I can't blame you. It feels so harsh. And it's because not Jesus is bad, but because Jesus is light. I was just talking to a friend this morning, and I was telling him that we, I think as Christians do a disservice because we expect people to catch on to this so much faster. Mm. What you just said is so true. Like we start talking to people as if they understand where we're coming from. Yeah. Right. But if you've lived in, in the ideology of the world, your whole life long, and the Bible's totally foreign to you, mm. all these, all this jargon that we throw around, like you said, even the word sinner, you know, you need a savior. You're a sinner. If you've never heard that before, I, what are you talking about? Why would I want anything to do with what you're saying? You know, yeah. Yeah. and so I love that you brought that out because this is huge. And I think it's important for us to remember because when we talk to other people in the world, hmm. it is initially pretty harsh what yeah. we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Prepare Which, them for that or dimmer switch a little bit of like, <laughs> all right, this is going to sound crazy, but hear me out. Like yeah. just preparing people for that moment instead of just barging into the room and flipping open the blinds. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, it's good that we're following up this with safety then, because why mm. safety when you're talking about Jesus being the light of the world? Yeah. Where's the safety? Yeah. So I'm super close. I don't think I told you this, Amber. Um, the musical Les Miserables is coming to our community. Oh. And is, I've, I've always been a musical guy. It's my favorite musical of all time. Nothing, nothing makes me cry like Les Mis. And I decided on a whim about a month ago, I'm going to buy the book. So Ooh. I bought Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. It comes 1,202 pages of very small print. <laughs> so I'm, last night I got to page 1,151. So I'm in the home stretch. I'm going to finish tonight. Wow. And uh, last night I'm reading about, um, yeah, don't have time to tell the whole story, but Jean Valjean, kind of the hero whose life has been changed by forgiveness and mercy. He's, he's carrying... Um, the wounded, what boyfriend of his kind of adopted daughter through the sewers of Paris. And it's like 50 pages because the sewers are so dark. And there's like these pits of just like quicksand that suck people in to die. And he, he can't oh. see if, if he's going to step on concrete or sand. And, um, you know, Victor Hugo is just a master. He brings out when you can't see something. When you can't see what's in, in front of you or above you or beneath you, every single step is so dangerous. Yeah. And so when we say Jesus is the light of the world, yep, it, it's harsh. But when I walk on a sunny day, I, I see where I am. 
I see if there's a car coming. I see if I'm going to run into something. I see if there's a pothole in the ground and it keeps me safe. Yeah. yeah. And so um, Jesus is just so profound that way that um, he gives us the whole truth and turns up the light because he loves us and he, mm -hmm. he wants to keep us from danger and falling into the, the pits of condemnation and despair. It's beautiful. Did I tell you that I got chased on Thanksgiving? <laughs> no, tell me more. <laughs> Chase? I was walking. Yeah. Well, were you talking about walking through the sewers? Yeah. I was literally walking through my neighborhood because like everybody else, I ate too much on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yep. But it gets dark super fast now, right? Yeah, sure. So it was maybe six or seven o'clock at night. It was, it was not late. And I was walking through my neighborhood with my 18 year old and it was kind of chilly. So we both had put our hoodies up. <laughs> And we walk by a house and someone looked out their window at the same time that I was, you know, walking by. So I just kind of looked at them. They looked at me and I said to my daughter, isn't that so weird that we just like locked eyes and all of a sudden three guys came out and started chasing us. What? Yes. I'm not kidding. And so like they're yelling, Hey, Hey, get back here, get back here. And I, I we had just turned a corner. I'm like, do we run? Do we stop? So I'm like, we're stopping. I'm like, Hey, what's up? Like, what's, what's going on? And they're like, were you going through our garage? Were you going through our cars? Were you? And I'm like, we, we just got done eating supper. We're just, <laughs> what, like, we live here. But what you said, like in the light, nobody would chase an almost 50 year old woman, right? <laughs> like looking like she's definitely going through my stuff, but in the dark with my hood up, it can get dangerous fast. So. <laughs> I'm picturing you. Maybe you're just a super smart thief and people knew you put the hood down. You're like, no, I'm just a, I'm just a mom. I would never steal your stuff. <laughs> I totally scary. went into mom, mom mode then because they were like 20 years old. I'm like, dude, you need to be a good neighbor. You can't just be chasing people down the street. Like, I could have fallen. <laughs> I could have fallen. They're like, have a good night. Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, this is the new favorite part of my day. <laughs> oh, well, okay. anyway, okay, so sermon number two, no one can keep you safe like Jesus. Hmm. And you talk about Jesus being our good shepherd, which is really important because as sheep, we A, tend to wander, and B, we tend to follow the flock. So some people might think, hey, you know, I'm pretty good. I don't wander really. Hmm. What would you say to that? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, so in getting ready for the sermon, I was kind of studying, you know, we t you know the, even the Bible in the book of Isaiah says, we all like sheep have gone astray. And so I'm, I'm studying sheep and mm -hmm. learning, you know, wh why do sheep go astray? And what I learned is that because they want something good. Right. Um, they're hungry. And look, there's some green grass over there. And oh, maybe that's taking me away from my shepherd. Um, but that's, that's a good thing. I, I want that. That's good for me. And to me, that was like a real metaphor for life that um, so often it's not some terrible, wicked thing we're going after. Um, you know, money is a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Fulfilling career is a good thing. Family is a good thing. Um, think of being a really organized person. Like, I want to have my schedule. I want to be in control of everything. But sometimes you you wander so far in the direction of yes. work or raising kids or uh, fitness or relaxation that they're not bad things, which is why they're so deceiving. But eventually you turn around and say, wait, how did I, I'm putting my peace in like my perfect plan and calendar instead of God is with me, or I had a productive day Woo! versus Jesus forgives me, or wait, mm -hmm. how many Sundays has it been since we were at church or read our Bible? You, you know, we often don't intend to stray as far as we do, but sometimes, you know, one bite of grass after another bite of grass and you, you turn around and. Jesus says a little speck in the distance instead of your constant companion by your side. Yeah. And then of course we have the flocking instinct, which means that we all tend to go astray. We just kind of follow like whoever's leading us. We just, we don't even think we just kind of follow along after them. Yeah. So why is it so hard? Even as adults, it doesn't matter what time of your life. It really, I wish it did. I wish we could say, you know, mm. once you get to this point in your life, you're not, yeah you know, prone to that, but that's not true. We're always prone to this. Yeah. Why? 
Yeah, I was just at a, a local Christian high school this morning for a, a pastor's meeting, and uh, the man who gave chapel, it was really, really good. Um, and he said, um, he said, you know, um, the rest of life is a lot like high school, just without the class. There'll still be kids whose approval you want. There'll still be popular people. Yeah. There'll still be temptations. There'll still be work. There'll still be frustrations. Like what you're experiencing here, you're kind of confined to this school and this forced schedule. But he said, really, life is more like high school than you think. And I thought of that when I, I heard your question, like yeah, we deep within us, we want to be liked, whether we're a high school freshman or in our 40s or moving into a retirement community or a nursing home. Um, and it's really hard because, you know, when God likes us because of Jesus, he likes it when we do God pleasing things, but we can't see God smiling or giving us the thumbs up. What we can see are people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so hard to walk as sheep by faith and not by sight. Cause I, I can see my buddies nodding and smiling and clapping, yes. but I can't, I can't see Jesus doing that. And so that's why we're so prone to wander because I, I want approval. It's hard to remember that I have it in Christ, but it's, it's very easy to see when I have it in people. Mm -hmm. and the tension of people pleasing and giving into the crowd. Yeah, that's huge. It was a big shock to me. That was one of the things that I learned at the nursing home that I still saw that at the nursing mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. that people could be so easily influenced by their peers mm -hmm. for good or for bad, you mm -hmm. know, and that wow. you just try, I mean, you never would, you'd never be in this situation to do it, but you actually try to like switch somebody from their table where they're eating at once, you know, like <laughs> you say, Hey, so-and-so is alone today. Can we move you over there? No, <laughs> I've always sat here. I sit by her and I sit by her and I, sit, I know, but she has no one to sit by her. I know, but I sit here. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's the same, no matter yeah. what age you're at, you're always wow. with your peers and wow. looking yeah. for their approval. Yeah. Can I say real quick, uh, yeah. you know, that, Jesus is the good shepherd. What a profound thought that despite the fact that we wander and despite the fact that we, you know, have this flocking instinct that the good, I love that line, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, yeah. which if you've never read the Bible, that, that sounds insane. I mean, can you imagine farmer dies for his cows? Farmer <laughs> jumps in front of semi truck to save cow. <laughs> You'd say, what? No, the cows are for your consumption, for your use. Yeah. And so when Jesus tells it, I, I wonder what people like their expression when he said that, like what shepherd would ever, the shepherd's more important than the sheep. What sh there's only one shepherd. There's a hundred sheep. Why would you sacrifice yourself? And so just the profound selflessness and love of Jesus to do that for us. We are the lesser and yet he sacrifices the greater man. What a, what a Jesus, huh? Yeah. So true. Hmm. Sermon number three, connected to Jesus, you will grow. Hmm. This sermon talks about three crucial moments that we all face, confusion, condemnation, and temptation. Hmm. How can following Jesus be confusing? Ooh, yeah. So this comes from John 15, which is the parable of the, the vine and the branches. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, you know, those that my father loves, the, the good branches, God prunes them so that they bear more fruit. And that's the confusing part. You, you would think, hey, if I'm connected to Jesus, if God loves me, he wants to bless yeah. me, then he would he would prevent pain. Right. Um, he wouldn't prune me. Pruning is like a cutting back what's living and good for the sake of something better that we can't yet see. And wow, how many times haven't we said, God, why are you doing, why, why are mm -hmm. you, I'm praying about this, God, are you not listening to me? It's so confusing when you think, yeah. if you love me and if you're powerful, then why this? Why this struggle? Why this cancer? Why this autoimmune? Why this anxiety? Why you know, fill in the blank human struggle? Um, so I, I love, I mean, we see it in nature. We see it in our own bodies. No pain, no gain. We, we know when we're raising kids, they got to go through tough times to grow in character. But sometimes when you're an adult, you forget and you think, okay, now is the season of life where all the gain comes without pain. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, no, 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 the, the best branches they grow the most fruit when we prune them and cut them back yeah so he's, he's cutting back on the confusion i think by reminding us how growth happens in nature and how it happens in life and look at the apostle paul i was reminded of this the other day because i was having a conversation with a friend who was talking to me about prayer 
and he was saying, oh, Jesus healed everyone. And I'm like, no, he didn't heal everybody. <laughs> and he's like, no, he healed everybody. Like everybody who came to him was healed. And I'm like, yeah, but he left places, you know? And then mm -hmm. anyway, eventually I got to, I'm like, but what about the apostle Paul? And my grace is sufficient to you. I mean, Paul even had good reasons to argue with God. Like I could do so much more. If you would just, I mean, like, you see what I'm doing here? Like I could do more. Yeah. Just give me what I'm asking because I think I can serve you better. And God's like, mm. no, mm. I get that call. And the answer is yeah. no. My mm. grace is sufficient. Wow. Yeah. Painful. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I think of Paul, lots of my favorite writings of Paul come from the time when he was being pruned sitting in a prison. Oh. You know, he's so fruitful. He's carrying out these missionary journeys. He's killing it. And then he gets arrested and he sits for years. But God kind of knew, oh, Paul, you don't know. But six months from now, the spirit's going to come into your heart and Philippians is going to happen. Yeah. And give it a little bit of time. If, you know, it's by grace that you've been saved is about to come out of your pen. But he couldn't see that at the time. It was just the pruning of his imprisonment. So, man, it's it's easy when it's Paul. It's really hard when it's me. <laughs> so... <laughs> Totally on, agree. Oh, I would love to only be able to use examples from the Bible for the rest of my ministry. My life is good. I'm just going to use all these poor suckers in the Bible who didn't get what they want. That's, yes, so true. That's not how God works. Okay, so it can seem hard to deny ourselves with all these temptations. Like you were saying, you know, the temptation is to always the greener grass, right? I want more finances, more, my marriage to be just so, all this. So why should we remain with Jesus when we're just struggling to survive? Like you're going through the temptations, you're working through the addiction, you're staying faithful in your marriage the day after day when it's hard and it feels loveless. And you're saying, remain in Jesus. <laughs> like yeah. why? What, what hope do we have there? Yeah. Um, Jesus said it first, so that's my defense. He, uh, in John 15, that's his repetitive word, remain in me as I remain in you, if you remain in me. So that's kind of his stay connected. Uh, don't detach yourself from the vine and try to be an independent branch. And, and I could maybe give a kind of a harsher, blunt, truthful answer to that question, and then maybe a more inspiring one. My blunt one would be because if if you disconnected a branch from the trunk of a tree in your front yard, the branch would not be very happy very soon. Right. Right. It would have more freedom. It could, I know with a strong enough wind, it could explore the whole front yard, but very soon it would be very thirsty, very dry, very dead. Um, and Jesus says, you know, maybe this world could be easier for you if you weren't a Christian, but if you didn't have me, you wouldn't have forgiveness. You wouldn't have heaven. You wouldn't have hope. You wouldn't have eternity. Um, it's very small what you have to suffer compared to what you're going to gain, even if you can't see it yet. Um, and then maybe that's the inspiring part of it is, is Jesus says, Hey, it's not easy, but you're with me. Yeah. Um, I love, it's a super short parable in Matthew 13, the parable of the hidden treasure where Jesus says, once upon a time, there was this guy who found a treasure in a field. And when he found it, he hid it again. He went back, sold everything he had and with joy bought that field. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved that because of the joy, like, wait, you're losing, you're selling everything you had, you're giving up everything that used to bring you happiness. The guy said, yep, and I'm even happier because I found something better. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna make sure when we talk about Jesus and God, um, you know, we just describe him in ways that are so beautiful and profound and glorious that the thought of anything else compared to him, wait, I could sleep with whoever I want, I could keep all my money, like all of that would seem so small compared to, but I'm talking about God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about God right here, despite my sin, in the room with me right now and tomorrow and the day after and for eternity, and it's only going to get better. So um, maybe that's important for us to do. Let's glorify, magnify, hallow the name of God, lift it up in praises so that when, when the sacrifice comes, when we can't have our earthly cake and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heaven's gift too, that it's an easier choice because we know that God is infinitely better. And we all, I mean, we're all going to struggle our whole life long, but how many times haven't you like succumbed to the temptation? And then you're like, ah, oh, this isn't as good as I thought it would be. Right. You know, like yes. me, I go without sugar for 10 months and then I'm like, dude, I'm just going to 
get that bag of chocolate chips and it's going to be awesome. And it was awesome until like two hours later when I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so sick. Like I am <laughs> so sick. Why did I do this? Why didn't anybody stop me? Why? Right. <laughs> you know, like, yes. So many times this, the temptation in the moment feels like it's going to be the best, yeah. but it doesn't take long and you get bit like yeah. so yeah. soon afterwards. If we could only remember yes, the way that bite feels. Yes, the short-term pleasure and long-term yeah. yeah. Hey, I just used that the other day. I gave that to someone. She was very thankful. Nice. I think I might be responsible for a tattoo soon on her wrist. So anyway, Let's which go. you are responsible for. <laughs> I stole it from another pastor, so yeah. yeah. Okay, sermon number four. Jesus is the only way. You talk about the five areas in our that in our lives that can affect us all mm-hmm. pretty, pretty profoundly. Mm-hmm. Family, friends, fitness, which is our physical... Um, health, finances, and faith. Trouble in any one of those areas can throw us off, but so often it's like the domino effect where it's like your health Mm -hmm. goes, which impacts your finances, which impacts your relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the whole ball of wax, you know, like they say, when it rains, it pours. How does Jesus help us when everything is chaos? Mm, Yeah. Uh, You know, obviously following Jesus doesn't make all the the pain of this world go away. Um, I sometimes picture Jesus. Have you ever swam in the ocean before? Yeah, love to. You know, you, you get out to the point where your feet can't touch anymore, and then the waves come, and it's uh, that can be scary because yep. it's it's deep. I'm in over my head. Yep. I I think of Jesus almost like he, he gets you back to that spot where your feet can touch on something solid that doesn't move, and the waves still come. And sometimes they come with force, but if my feet are on the ground, I'm not just like floating in the chaos yes. of, oh my goodness, of sheer panic. So same water, same waves, but if you can touch ground, I think that's what kind of faith is, is just setting my feet down in something solid. Like, okay, God is, God is here. God is for me. God is with me. Um, God's working through this. God is going to use this. God's going to end this suffering. So mm-hmm. d- just these promises so we can, you know, be still. He's God. He's my rock. I'll praise him. So yeah. the, the waves might still be coming, but I'm okay because I got Jesus. Okay. So you talked about believing towards God. Mm. And I love that image because we usually are looking towards our circumstances and mm. all the chaos. So why do you tell us, guys, I know that's the temptation, but you got to look towards God. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, in the Greek original language, the phrase believe in, Sometimes the preposition is, uh, it's the preposition ice, which means towards something or with the end goal of something. So if they were walking to Jerusalem, they would say they were walking ice, like towards in that direction. And uh, Jesus uses this phrase when he talks about faith, that it's not just faith uh, in, although sometimes that phrase is used. Another variation is faith towards something. Hmm. And I just kind of love that. Like when, you know, our, our church, we have this big cross. Yeah. And I'm not always looking at it, but it's like, okay, let me turn my eyes towards that and just just think deeply, meditate on, okay, okay. <laughs> if that's my God, if if I have the yes. kind of God who is is so patient and kind um, that he would give up everything to save me, uh, if he's the good shepherd that would lay down his life for me when I wander, um, wow, things can be in chaos, but there's such a God of profound love who holds me in his hand. And that just gives me a kind of peace that goes beyond understanding. Yeah. Sermon number five, Jesus means life after death. This was your Easter sermon. Yeah. So, um, you said everybody has to come to the point of they have to figure out two questions. What are you going to do with Jesus of Nazareth? And what are you going to do about death? And typically we break into three groups, all in, so-so, or not sure. So can you describe what those three groups are? Yeah. You know, people who give a ton of thought and, and focus, they think a lot about life, death, truth, lies, Jesus, uh, deeply spiritual things. Those are all in. So, so it was like, oh yeah, I believe, but I don't know. It's not my priority, my passion. Mm -hmm. I'll see you on, on Christmas Eve, pastor. Um, And not sure people who are generally curious, like, I, I don't know a lot about this. I'm here with my, my grandma or my friend who invited yeah. me or, or my new significant other. Um, 
So to be honest with you, I find Christmas Eve and Easter as a pastor to be the most challenging sermons of all, all year because there's a lot of people and there's a lot of people in all those groups. Right. There's a lot of people who are like, I'm here every Sunday, pastor. I know your name. You know mine. I'm all in with Jesus. And there's yes. others who's like, yeah, sh sure, I guess. I'm not Muslim or atheist, so I'm a Christian. But <laughs> there's not a lot of evidence of it. And then there's these other people who are just generally curious and they've never heard the story before. So squeezing that all in and not keeping people past Easter brunch is one of the great challenges of the pastoral ministry. So <laughs> say a prayer for your you pastor guys, this Easter. You guys have sort of hit on one way to keep them there. I know you were all excited about donuts after the service. So, <laughs> there, so there's that, right? We, we bribe them with sugar. So it's short-term pleasure, but it's... For the moment, people. For one time. You couldn't do the Easter eggs this morning, but don't worry. We got you. There's, there's sugar. All right. So some people, because this goes right into that. Some people might have thought you were a little harsh. You know, you described the all-in Christians, right? And then you said, so, so. Some of you are the two times a year hmm. Christians. And grandpa drug, you know, his granddaughter to Easter service. And you're like, Jesus isn't your dentist. You know, he's not like a check in every six months and you can, you get a pass. This is a, okay. Why do you want, why did you want to talk to that so-so person on Easter and be like, mm. you know, it's not a good place to stay. Mm. Uh, my dentist, by the way, goes to our church. And when he heard that <laughs> analogy, he was very offended. So he's like, <laughs> don't bring me into your, your rebuke of <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is super difficult, to be honest. Um, you finally see someone uh, on Easter Sunday or Christmas Eve, same situation, and you're, you're so glad they're there. You're happy that they they showed up. But it's this conflicted feeling. Like, I I, I think a, a really low-level commitment to Jesus, like, I'll, I'll pray when I'm in danger, and sh sure, I believe, and I'll, I'll see every six months in church. I, th I think at the end of the day, that really reflects a low level view of salvation. Mm -hmm. That if I don't love God a lot, maybe I don't, I don't realize how much he loved me first. And Easter felt like the time to kind of call that out is that's just an untenable, illogical. I'm trying to picture saying that to the apostles who yeah. witnessed like, wait, we were such bad sinners who bailed on him and he died for us and conquered death. I, I guess I could stop in every six months. Like that would have been wild to them. They would have said, what? No, we would die for him. We would do anything for him. Mm -hmm. We'll stand up to the government for him. We'll be flogged and rejoice for him. If, if yeah. there really is a God who came down from heaven to live and die and conquer death in my place, then, then I can't be so-so about it. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you're not sure. That kind of makes sense to me, the ignorance. But to, to know a God who gave up everything that we could have, everything, and just kind of like, cool, I'll click the like button. <laughs> like, no, like we, we, we got to shake ourselves out of that kind of common American okay, sort of non-practicing Christian. That, no, he, he calls mm -hmm. us to something more because his love is so much more. I've said it for years and there's nothing biblical about this, but I think the most common phrase said at the throne of God is I was going to. Mm -hmm. I was going to get around to following you. I was going to get around to making that a priority. I was going to, mm -hmm. but we just take it for granted that we have a lot more time. And yeah. so we just, yeah. you know, especially young people like, eh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll get there. You know, when I have kids, I, yeah. I definitely want to go to church when I have kids. But right now, I mean, eh, yeah. you don't know how much time you're going to have on this That's earth, true. you know, no yeah. relationship mm -hmm. you should be put aside like that. Yeah. So, so what's uh, your, real quick. Hard? Just to save myself from the, the Pharisee temptation is to think, well, I'm in church every Sunday. I'm not so-so. Yes. But, oh, but there, good. Yeah, there are other ways to kind of you know, not pursue Jesus' radical command to love and forgive and be kind and patient and generous. Um, so I think the more we turn up his glory and sacrifice, the more all of our commitment kind of rises um, mm -hmm. with that as too. So I'm guessing all of us will have something where like, yeah, you know, I've kind of gotten shrug of the shoulders with that part of the Christian life. Yeah. Um, but man, we have a, a savior who died on a cross and conquered the grave. And we're going to get to celebrate that again this year. And uh, let's uh, let's love the way he first loved us. Awesome. All right. So what would you say to the person who's on the fence? Mm. Um, I would say who who has ever loved you like Jesus? 
Mm-hmm. Like who? Seriously, th- think back in your life. You can rank if you want who has loved you most: a best friend, a spouse, a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa. Um, who who has ever forgiven you as much, stuck with you as much, listened to you as much? Um, man, Jesus is so profoundly good. And yep, yeah. yep. Without the filter, he can be super offensive and off-putting. He, he's going to call you out, convict you. But what he offers you uh, in his love and in his grace is better than any paycheck. It's it's better than any relationship. It's better than any friendship. And so I just want you to know if you're kind of on the fence, unsure, g- keep looking into Jesus, look towards Jesus, investigate Jesus. And I, I think maybe like me and Amber, you'll be stunned that there is no one who has ever or will ever love us the way that Jesus does. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Good Man. sermon. Good sermon series. Yeah, yeah. I was, this was a, I, I remember preaching this live and this was, this was good. It was just qu- quiet at all the right moments and like, yep, heads nodding. I almost forgot how great Jesus was. And this was just week after week. John's gospel is so good at that. So yeah, I enjoyed it too. So here's a question for you. This Wait. Easter, should we look forward to a uh, suit jacket again with the shirt tucked in? <laughs> or is that a one time? Is that is that once a year or is that a one time only? Or I tucked in my shirt last year. You did. And you made a point of it. You made sure <laughs> to show everybody and, you know, said this was the one day you were going to tuck in your shirt. So just wondering yeah. if you're still, you, you, you had know, forgotten that. So you probably wouldn't have done it now this Easter. Uh, I thought, um, you know, Peter was crucified upside down. Paul lost his head for Jesus. I should join the great sacrifices of Christian history and tuck in my shirt for the sake of the resurrection of the dead. Thank you for that sacrifice. <laughs> I, I see I see what you want to say in your eyes, Amber, but you're not saying it because you're a better human I'm than I am. completely <laughs> respectful. I respect whatever you decide. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for a great conversation. Um, if you're listening and you're interested, actually this month at Time of Grace, we have an awesome new resource. Uh, it's a book version of the series called Jesus Hashtag No Filter. Um, you got to check out the cover. It's one of my favorite designs that our uh, graphics team has come up with. And it's going to dive deeply in, ask some uh, good study questions. So I hope you can get your hands on a copy. Just go to timeofgrace.org and we'd love to send you one for your best gift to our ministry. I uh, hope you are blessed as you worship the greatest king of all kings. Have a great day and we'll catch you next time.